Hi everyone, I'm Tim from Revolution Bike Park and today we're here with a slightly different video, we're taking a break from all of the sort of updates as to what's happening at the park, because uh, today I want to talk about bikes and in particular our hire fleet. So as this year's hire bike fleet reaches the end of their time with us, uh, I want to take a moment to sort of talk about the bikes that we have had this year, uh, as well as my sort of general thoughts on sort of owning a high-end mountain bike or, you know, in our case, 12 high-end mountain bikes. So this is the second fleet of hire bikes that we've actually had from Canyon. Uh, the first fleet we had was a set of Canyon Sender AL5s. Uh, if you're not familiar with sort of Canyon range, the AL5 was the sort of entry-level downhill bike, uh, full aluminium, great bike and we had that for about 18 months. However, over the last few years, uh, we've been seeing sort of changes in the world of bikes and when it came to this year's fleet those changes have actually had a big impact on how we sort of managed and the kind of bikes that we've had. Specifically I'm talking about the sort of significant improvements we've seen in enduro and trail bikes. Um, there's no doubt that you know Revolution Bike Park uh, is a park that is sort of built for the downhill bike and you know to a certain extent downhill bikes over the recent years have been built more and more for parks like Revolution. You know, and as the owner of a sort of downhill focused sort of specific part, I'm obviously a little bit biased towards the DH bike. Um, you know, but even myself has sort of witnessed the shift away from downhill bikes. Um, you know, and I would say over the last few years, far more, possibly even the majority of people now, are actually riding uh, sort of enduro and trail bikes at the park. And this move away from sort of downhill bikes, I think is sort of reflected in Canyon's decision a year or so back to actually stop producing the Sender AL5 and sort of focus on the more higher end models of the Sender range. At the time, I was pretty concerned over sort of what this change meant for the park. You know, the previous bike we've had, the AL5, was in many ways sort of a perfect higher bike. You know, it was a fully capable modern downhill bike. It was sort of fully aluminium. Um, you know, it had all the capabilities of a top end bike, but in a package that was pretty economical to maintain and repair. Um, and as such, you know, ideal to be renting out to the public. So at the time we were talking about new bikes, you know, the only real downhill option was the sort of Sender CFR range, you know, which is the full carbon fiber, top of the range bike. So neither, you know, Canyon or ourselves were particularly keen on having a large number of these sort of high cost bikes for higher bikes. So the solution that Canyon put forward uh, was the Torque. Um, the Torque's a 180 millimeter travel enduro bike, or, you know, I actually like to refer to them as sort of these sort of super enduro bikes or long travel enduro bikes. Um, you know, this was an aluminium enduro bike that Canyon had positioned as a sort of potential alternative to the entry level downhill bike. And this is the point in the video where, you know, I essentially have to get a bit of a plate out and serve myself a fairly large portion of humble pie. And this is partly why I wanted to make this video, you know, because I've got to be honest, initially I wasn't particularly happy with this idea. Um, you know, if I look back sort of honestly about where I was at that time, I think my main concerns, or well, there were two main concerns that I had. Um, the first, and I'll put my hand on my heart with this, was it was a bit of snobbery. Um, you know, as a dedicated downhill park, I kind of wanted our fleet of hire bikes to be downhill bikes. I can't really claim that that was based on sort of a rational thought process. Uh, it was probably a bit of pride, uh, you know, desire for a bit of prestige. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I can't really put my finger on the sort of exact emotions that led me to think that. Um, but ultimately, you know, when you're running a business, I kind of just had to get over that and look at it a bit more critically. You know, because when you're, you know, running a business that's as sort of complicated as, as a bike park is, you know, you, you very much have to face reality. And, and at the time, the reality was that there wasn't really a good option for a fleet of downhill rental bikes. So whilst my first concern was a little bit snobbish, should we say, and maybe not quite justified. My second concern, I think, was more based in reality and I think uh, was based on my sort of, or at least my perception of reality and what I'd seen from bikes over the previous years. You know, having looked into the talk, having seen the sort of spec of it, you know, I had no doubt that it was a, a great bike that would be more than capable of handling a day's riding on the hill here. However, my concern for enduro or trail bikes um, has always been about longevity. Um, you know, unlike downhill bikes, these bikes are designed to be all-rounders. Um, they're not specifically designed to be put on a hill like this all the time. Um, and I was a bit concerned that if we sort of constantly operated them at the sort of most extreme level of riding that they were sort of designed for, whether or not they'd last out the year. You know, the best kind of analogy I can come up with to sort of explain my thinking on it is that, you know, most sort of of your average cars, not so much mine, but, you know, most people who have half-decent cars, um, 
you could probably push that car and drive it at 120 miles an hour you know, within the right, you know, the right circumstances and likelihood doing that for a short period of time wouldn't have any ill effects. Now, if you took an average car and you exclusively drove it at 100 miles an hour or 120 miles an hour all the time, you would probably find that it wouldn't last very long being pushed to that extreme, even though at least theoretically it's capable of doing it. You know, I gotta be honest with you, you know, my concern was that if we took on a fleet of bikes that weren't downhill bikes um, and we stuck them on this hill for an entire year, they wouldn't last the year. You know, we had, they'd, they'd be broken to pieces before you knew it. Um, you know, and I raised this to Canyon and, you know, the guys at Canyon, they were confident though. They were confident in the talk uh, and more importantly, they agreed to stand by it. You know, they made it clear that, you know, if I was right, if there was problems, if they didn't really make it through, that they would sort the problems, they'd replace the bikes, they'd fix them, whatever was needed, you know, but ultimately, you know, they were confident that we wouldn't have these issues. So I went with them and we agreed on, basically the main fleet would be the Torx and then we'd just take one of each of the sender sizes, uh, just for those who are looking to actually demo a sender who are thinking of getting one. And this is the part where the humble pie comes in because you know there's no real way for me to sugarcoat it. I was completely wrong. Um, the Torx have been literally bomb-proof. Um, so much so that I'm kind of almost doubting my own memories of the last year as to how much work we've done and how many issues they've had. Um, you know, don't misunderstand me, you know, owning any kind of these bikes is requires a lot of maintenance and these certainly have been no exception. Um, you know, we've got Jack from Lost Yak who does all of our maintenance servicing and he's had a pretty busy year. You know, lots of components that need replacing, uh, wheels that need straightening, brakes that need bleeding. Um, you know, all the usual stuff, um, including sort of checking and servicing them every couple of weeks. But the main sort of structural parts of the bike, the sort of uh, frame, be frame pivot bearings, um, you know, all the sort of core components have literally just kept going without any issues whatsoever. Um, you know, some of these bikes have done 50 plus days on this hill, uh, maybe even more, and they're running on the same original frame bearings. I think we've only actually swapped out a couple of headset bearings. Um, you know, and headset bearings is one thing that are notorious for failing when you use a bike as much as we do, and when you jet wash it as much as we do. Um, but barring sort of being stripped and regularly cleaned and greased, we are still running the same bearings. And I would hazard a guess to say that with a little bit of cleaning and re-greasing, there's no reason to think they wouldn't go on for months, if not another year of operation. So I'm not 100% sure what's next for these bikes. Um, they come to us on loan from Canyon and they're gonna get sent back now. Um, often they may sell them on, I'm not 100% sure, but ultimately they are good to go for another year or so. Um, and like I say, obviously if we weren't closing the park, the likelihood is we'd be hanging on to them for at least a few more months because like I say, they're still in pretty much brand new condition apart from some cosmetic issues and scuffs and scratches in places. So having spent like the whole year with both the Talk and the Sender, um, I guess it's maybe quite interesting to you guys to know which of these bikes I would recommend. Um, and to be honest, after seeing them both, sort of how they performed over the year, I'm a little torn as to which of these bikes I would recommend to you. Um, on the one hand, you know, the Sender is undoubtedly the better bike. Uh, the Sender represents the sort of pinnacle of bike technology, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to this kind of extreme downhill that we offer here. Um, and you know, there's no doubt that for a park like Revolution, the Sender is the tool for the job. However, if you ask me which of these two bikes I'd recommend you buy, I'd probably have to say the Torque. Um, you know, the Torque is an extremely capable bike. Uh, you know, when it comes to the kind of uh, riding we have at the park at the sort of most extreme level, you might see a little bit of compromise in performance compared to the sender, you know, but in exchange for that compromise, you can do everything else with this bike that you could ever want to do. You know, the Torque is a bike that you can, you know, bring here on a Saturday and you can hit 50 to 1 on it all day. And then on the Sunday, you can take your family, your kids for a leisurely ride down a canal path. And it'll do that and everything in between. And I think that's pretty incredible uh, that it can offer that kind of all round package. You know, like I say, the sender will probably hit 50 to one better, maybe depending on what kind of ride you are. Um, you know, it'll certainly hit the downhill tracks better, 
but you ain't riding that down a canal path. Well, not unless you want to be really slogging for most of your day. You know, also, you know, as I sort of said earlier, not only, you know, is the torque capable of hitting 50 to one on paper, it's capable of doing it in the real world and over the long term. You know, it's kind of really hard for me to truly express exactly how tough a life these bikes have. You know, they, you know, they get ridden a lot and a lot of the people who are hiring them are fairly new, inexperienced riders who don't necessarily know how to sort of ride with finesse and sort of take care of the bike. They're often sort of slamming into a lot of stuff. You know, and for these talks to have not only sort of survived that abuse, but to get to a whole end of a year of it without showing any signs out of a few cosmetics, you know, it is a remarkable bike. So yeah, I would confidently recommend the talk to anyone, um, you know, like I say, I put them through as rough a pace as I can do and I'm really confident that you know, if they can survive here, they're going to survive anything that the average rider is going to throw at them. So the fact that I'm sat here recommending the Enduro bike over the uh, downhill bike, you know, does this mean that the sort of age of downhill bikes is coming to an end or even over now? No, I, in short, I don't think so. Uh, I think there'll always be a place for the downhill bike. Um, you know, I see this change as a real positive, you know, we've seen such growth and improvement in the sort of technology of bikes that you know we're able to incorporate the capabilities and performance of a downhill bike into a more all-round package you know and i think for the average rider and consumer that is a really really good thing you know when buying a bike there is a lot to consider you know particularly you know given the sort of high cost uh, of the investment you're making at this kind of level and I think reality-wise, when people are looking for a bike, they'll, they'll, they'll focus on a lot of things, maybe like, you know, look, brand loyalty, sort of prestige, you know, a lot of the sort of more emotional sort of side of it. Um, when you're running a higher fleet, you are a bit less romantic about bikes uh, and you consider a, a lot more boring things like, you know, what is the sort of cost and frequency of the maintenance required? You know, are they suitable for the task? Um, which I think for the average customer translates a bit more to, you know, will it do all the types of riding that you want to do and that you enjoy? You know, at the end of the day, there's no point buying a downhill bike if half of the riding you do is sort of trail riding or cross country. You know, and if you sort of, as an average consumer, were to take a fairly practical, non-romantic view of buying a bike, the talk for most people, I think, is gonna come out on top. You know, my thoughts, however, are that, like I say, there's always gonna be a place for a downhill bike. You know, the downhill bike is the tool for the job, for those who want to, you know, focus primarily on uplifted downhill, or if you're into racing, you know, um, you know you'll always be better off on the downhill bike if that's your, your aim. You know, and in my opinion, downhill is the sort of cutting edge of mountain biking, you know, and the downhill bike, you know, it's a tool for beating that path forward. So I think, yeah, absolutely, we'll always have downhill bikes. There'll always be a need for them. I think what we're seeing in sort of growth of the sort of super enjoy type bikes is, you know, I've often seen downhill as sort of like the Formula One of mountain biking, you know, and in Formula One though, we don't sell the Formula One cars to the general public. We take the really advanced technology that's developed in that in Formula One, and then we adapt that into a consumer product, which is right for the average person. And I feel like that's kind of what we're seeing a little bit here, which is, you know, the pushing the boundaries and the high technology of the downhill bike is then being picked up by uh, companies like Canyon and adapted into a sort of more consumer friendly product like the Torque. Uh, and I think that's just going to be a good thing going forward. So obviously this video has been a little bit sort of canyon heavy, but I think a lot of my thoughts and sort of observations regarding bikes, you know, are applicable across most brands. You know, a lot of brands are going in the same direction that Canyon are with their uh, range of bikes. Um, you know, obviously I'm a little biased towards Canyon. You know, they've supported the park for several years, um, but more so I've spent a lot of time with these bikes, you know, and the previous bikes. So that, you know, I'm confident in my sort of experience and views of them and I you know, thought it'd be useful to share that with you. I do though want to take a second to acknowledge something regarding our relationship with Canyon. Um, you know, putting your product into an environment like Revolution Bike Park is a bold move. You know, if your product's not up to the task, this part will expose it. And, you know, I'm not going to name any names and, you know, but there's been plenty of times in the past where we've had sort of conversations with companies that have sort of shied away from working with us because, you know, in reality, they know that product is not going to stand up to the kind of abuse it has here. 
you know, at least not in the long run. You know, whereas, you know, Canyon very much put their money where their mouth is. You know, they, they sent their products here into one of the toughest environments they could find. You know, and their confidence in their product, as I sort of talked about earlier, was proven 100% correct. Um, and as I said, I wasn't 100% confident. I didn't share their confidence early on that, um, that the talk particularly would, be, would uh, make it through the year. You know, but like I say, I've spent a year putting these through their paces, you know, literally kind of waiting for them to fail on me, uh, uh, but they didn't. So, you know, all I can conclude is that I was wrong, Canyon was right, and the talk is a freaking awesome bike. So anyway, I hope you found that at least somewhat interesting. Uh, I really wanted to give my thoughts and feedback on these bikes before they move on to the next part of their lives. So if you enjoyed the video, uh, make sure to subscribe and like and all that jazz. Uh, there are going to be more videos coming out. Hopefully we're going to do an update video soon regarding the uh, park. So stay tuned for that and I'll catch you in the next one.